Hello, I'm Sean Zadig, and I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for Verizon Media. I lead a team called the Paranoids. Our job is to help protect consumer, customer, and corporate data. We use our place on the internet to fight for our users and for the targeted, abused, and vulnerable. Thank you for attending our seminar today. So we are in a unique and historic cultural moment, and there are discussions occurring across the world and all levels of society on how we can better ensure that we create opportunities for more people. Black, indigenous, people of color, women, people with neurodivergences or disabilities, and LGBTQ plus communities. At Verizon Media, the Paranoids recognize that the entire cybersecurity industry suffers from a lack of diversity. Having a diverse and inclusive workforce is critical for a security organization, especially one that represents a worldwide user population like we at Verizon Media do. An inclusive security team is also more diverse than thought, and that helps us be more nimble in designing security solutions that can keep attackers out and protect vulnerable populations. We are pleased to partner with Nahansec, or AKA Ben Sadigipour, head of Hacker Education at HackerOne, to provide this seminar. We're hoping this will help you join the cybersecurity community and amplify your voice while helping us make our products safer and maybe even earn you some cash. Our bug bounty program is an integral part of our security team, enabling us to partner with those external to the company who give us a new perspective on identifying areas of improvement. We love the amazing connections and relationships the bug bounty program has brought to our table, along with the excellent security research provided to us by its participants. Now, just like security is everyone's responsibility, so is, the, is driving diversity and inclusion and making the cybersecurity industry reflect those who we protect. That being said, there's a lot to do. And I'm excited that you have given us this opportunity to share our knowledge and expertise with you. I hope this seminar inspires you to be paranoid. Thanks. Well, hello. Uh, thank you so much for that intro. I appreciate it. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Ben Sadegapur, aka Nahamsek. I'm the head of hacker education at Hacker One, and we have a f day filled with a lot of lots and lots of fun stuff happening. Um, so before we get started, quick intro uh, we had with Sean. Thank you so much again. Um, I'm going to have someone from uh, Verizon Media again joining us, uh, Chris Holtz, to talk about what bug bounties are and how to get um, you know into bug bounties from a manager's perspective. So let me bring on our friend Chris Holtz onto the screen. Before I do, if you're in a homie, you're already a part of the stream. Drop us some uh, emotes, and I'm going to bring Chris Holtz from Verizon Media's Paranoids on the screen right now. Hey, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Awesome. Chat, let us know if you can hear uh, Chris's voice. I'm going to switch over to you. There we go. How's it going, man? Going well. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Man, the camera. All right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's been it's been a busy day. We're uh, ramping up for for our next event, but I don't want to get into that right now. We'll talk about yeah. Hold that thought. We'll come back to that in a little bit. I know we we're a little bit behind schedule, but um, you had some stuff to tell us about bug bounties and why bug bounties do um, programs and how does it benefit hackers? Yeah, so so bug bounty in a, a thirty second nutshell is where you know we partner with folks outside of our company to incentivize reporting security issues to us so that we can fix them and, uh, uh, and, and produce a more secure product and more secure ecosystem, protect our consumers, customers, and corporate data. Um, you know, in, in the Paranoids, Paranoids are our security organization for Verizon Media. Uh, I think, I'm sure Sean said that earlier, but um, you know, we have all sorts of teams doing all sorts of, all sorts of the security activities that you think of in uh, in any general organization, but um, one of the things that we have found particularly valuable over the past few years has been reaching out outside of our company. Right, we we hire the best that we can, but um, and best in the world. But we recognize that we are not the only people in the world that care about our company and our users um, and the security of of everything that we touch. 
So, you know, bug bounty is our way to, to open that up and say, anybody is welcome to help us be more secure. Um, and, and, you know, that comes in the form of uh, different bug reports that come in through, you know, we run a, a program on HackerOne. Um, there are other platforms available where uh, a company can reach out and say, this is the way that you can send us a report. And, um, you know, in, in response to that, we will uh, fix the issues internally. And then uh, there might be a reward for you um, if that's in line with, with, our, uh, with our ideals and our, our financial availability. Um, uh, you mentioned so, something. You know, in, in, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, I was going to ask. You mentioned about paying hackers. It looks like, and I just pulled up the bug bounty program on hackerone.com slash Ryzen Media. You guys have paid almost $11 million. You're 50000 away, I think, from $11 million. So you guys have been pretty invested in the community. Well, we might hit that later today. I think we've got some bounties <laughs> to pay out. Um, yeah, I mean, that. You know, we, we started our program in 2013. Um, so it's, yeah. been, it's been running for just about uh, I think it was, I think it was October, 2013. can't remember the exact day. Um, so it's, it's been running for seven years now. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we've had, uh, some phenomenal years in, in the, the past couple, past couple years of our, our history. Um, as we, as we moved from, you know, just the Yahoo program over to also encompassing AOL and some of the VDMS properties and, um, you know, we we protect all of the Verizon Media brands. It's not it's not just um, some of the the smaller smaller brands that they used to be covered. Um, yeah, you guys have gone from uh, I believe like in the beginnings was just swag and some gift cards, and then all the way to you know people is talking about how they're getting six digit bounties. You know, six digit paydays, not bounties, but uh, paydays at some point now, which is incredible, right? It's, it's been a long journey of seven years and. I'm sure you guys have gone some really, really good, cool vulnerabilities. I know some of that I have seen personally at life hacking events that were a little bit like, oof, like, wow, this, you know, people are finding some really incredible stuff. And it's been a very, very long and incredible journey for you guys to be here. Yeah, we, we look at, at the hackers as, as, as I said, as an extension of our security team. Um, and, you know, sometimes that's, that's small things. Um, you know, cross-site scripting is typically a small kind of thing. Um, but sometimes it's, it's bigger things. It's, uh, you know, um, we've, we've gotten reports across the whole spectrum of, um, everything listed, I think on our, on our bounty page. Um, and you know, I'm not going to, I won't share specifics about what those were, but you know, everything that we pay a bounty for, we see value in. That's a report that comes to us that, um, you know, we're thankful for, and we reward that with, um, you know, our, our current reward structure is, um, almost entirely monetary based. You know, it, it, it used to be different things. Other other programs um, might award in, in swag or, or gift cards, and and you know there's there's other other programs that do. Uh, they might have a, a rewards points program in their in their company, um, so they they do that kind of thing. Um, we don't really have that kind of structure, so we we lean more towards the the dollars space um, because you know money talks, yeah. um, and you know that's that's a great way to incentivize people. So I want to talk about a little bit about, you know, the partnership you guys have done with hackers, you know, doing, um, I, I don't, I've lost count of how many life hacking events you guys have done this year and last year, but what does it feel like, you know, traveling the world and being one of the reasons why uh, hackers get to travel the world and be able to visit some cool places? You know, we did Argentina, one of the coolest ones we did, um, you know, going to these like, exotic places and uh, being a part of that. How does that, you know, what does it mean to you guys as being a part of the team that makes this happen? Well, it doesn't feel like much right now because we're not traveling. Our, our our last event and our current event have have shifted focus to be entirely virtual, so that we're not putting people in um, in danger of uh, catching um, COVID or, or any other diseases. Um, but you know, in in the past, we we really leaned into the travel thing. It it was it was a part of of what makes the event special is that you you had an opportunity to go somewhere new, some someplace different in the world, open up your eyes to see. Um, in, in a lot of times, a, a different culture. Right. Um, the Argentina event in 2018 um, was my first time going to South America. It was a country that I don't really speak the language. Um, there's a lot of English speakers down there, but they also speak uh, Spanish or, or Portuguese um, Spanish, dialect. Yeah, Spanish. yeah, one of the dialects, yep. 
Yeah. Um, Chad, let us know if we're uneducated. I'm uneducated in this stuff, so let us know if we're making the mistake here and let us know if we can correct it. But yeah, it's uh, it's different. It's a different world when you go to and something that, you know, when you go for work, it's completely different. Yeah, yeah, it is. And and so one of the things that, that we've always tried to do is build in a little bit of tourist time to to the trip because it is it is a business trip, right? It's, it's a work mm-hmm. trip where we're going to a place to meet with um, in our case, we're trying to meet with the hackers, build relationships, um, you know, have that that one on one direct interaction or you know, group group to group um, direct interaction that um, has has historically been difficult to do remotely, um, you know, and, and with with the, the new change to everyone, a lot of companies working remotely, we're starting to get better at that and kind of forced over the past few months. Um, but there still feels like no, I, I miss I miss going out and being able to, to, to get some beers with people and talk about bugs and talk about some of the frustrations that they have um, with uh, with bug bounty programs and you know see if that's something that us as as a program if it's something we can change about our program to um, to solve that with our interactions or you know we might be in a position to put pressure on other programs and and solve that as a, as a larger problem. Yeah, and I think you guys. Um... I think, you know, having those relationships with the hackers and, you know, just going to get drinks, whatever it's coffee, getting drinks at the bar, going to dinner, lunch, and getting feedback directly given to you is very, very important. I'm curious to see outside of life hacking events, and we'll talk about the virtual settings in a little bit, but outside of life hacking events, how do you um, connect with the community? How do you collect that feedback? You know, what does that look like from a, you know, at a program at your scale, you know, with the amount of money you guys are spending? And I'm sure people always have feedback for you. What do you guys do outside this life hacking event to make sure you hear from uh, other folks? And how do you receive that feedback? Are there any channels you leverage and that sort of thing? We, we do as much as we can. Um, there's there's a, a community that, um, that you set up, Bug Money Forum, um, that's, that's a little more of a closed community intended for folks that are contributing back to the bug bounty community. Um, so, so, you know, we're, we're present there because we're giving back and, um, pressing on folks to change and, and grow and, um, improve the entire community. Um, but we also, every time we spend, we send out a bounty on our reports on, uh, our, our hack one platform. Um, every time we send out money or, or say that we're not going to, because a, a report might be outside of scope. Um, there's a, a survey link that we send out that is just a simple opportunity to be anonymous or, um, you know, you might, you might want to say who you are or tell us that there's a report that you want a particular response in, but it's an opportunity to give us a, a zero to 10 rating, um, and drop in some comments. Um, and we get all sorts of stuff in there. Thanks for, for doing this. The, the event that I was just at was amazing. Um, I, I hate the person that worked on that report. I never want to talk to them again. They're the worst ever. Why would you hire them? Um, you know, and everything in between that, right? Uh, you know, the, the, usually it's more towards the high side. You know, our, our general stats on that is that it, um, we're, we've been trending from um, seven, an average of seven about two years ago um, to about nine and a half right now, which yeah. is, is kind of shocking that it's so high um, considering how many of those, those links we've sent out. Um, but, you know, it's, it's important to have that open ability to, to get feedback. Um, and, you know, we want that to be anonymous because we, you know, or at least the opportunity to be anonymous. Um, because some, sometimes there's, there's history that comes into a conversation, right? If, if you tie, if we tie it to a particular report, um, you know, or a comment to a particular report, there might've been some back and forth in that, uh, in that situation that, um, the researcher just wants to vent about something and, uh, they want to feel heard. And, and, um, you know, we, we, we always try to listen and, uh, there's, there's usually something to be gained from, from every interaction like that. Yeah. And, um, about the survey thing, and you said you send that out to any bounty that you guys give out to any other hackers on the platform. Once a decision is made to make the bounty paid or not bounty. Has there been any, any, I want to, I want to, the reason why I asked this is I want to show why it's so important to participate in these surveys. Is there anything that drastically changed in the bug bounty program because of a piece of um, feedback you guys received through a survey or some other channel that you could discuss? I, the reason, again, the reason why I ask is I want people to see, hey, if yeah. you see a survey link, you get a bounty, you're unhappy about something that went wrong. This is your chance to speak directly to the team that's behind the bug bounty program and to get them to understand why you're frustrated and how they could, you know, fix the things that you, you know, may unintentionally make things difficult for hackers. 
I can't remember specifically any individual things that that triggered, you know, a significant change like that. Okay. Um, usually, usually the kind of feedback we get is um, this was a great experience. Thanks for being an awesome program. Um, or thanks for inviting me to this event. It was a lot of fun. Um, looking forward to seeing you again. Um, sometimes people complain about pieces of the process. Uh, and probably the, the largest change that we've made directly from feedback in that survey, at least, um, has been to try and be more transparent about our process. The, the way that work flows from the moment that you press submit on a report in the platform to when you see an email that says you got paid. Um, you know, and, and that at a high level, that looks like, you know, you, you, testing you as a researcher, you find a bug, you write a report, submit it to the platform. Um, we, we work with the hacker one triage service to perform um, validation and anything missing from the report, they will add extra details. Um, if the report is valid, they'll, uh, clean up those details and send it over to our team. Um, we'll do another, another double check on that and then go find the right engineers to hand that issue to package it up as, as an internal ticket instead of the hacker one ticket, we work in separate systems. Um, so we'll package it up, hand it to the engineers and our product security team will work with those engineers to make sure that that issue gets fixed. Once it's fixed, we will do, we'll retest the issue inside the company and, until we, you know, we are sufficiently happy with, with, uh, the, the rigor of the fix. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we'll come back to the hacker and ask you to retest it. Um, and this is an opportunity to, to, for, for us to get a little more information. Um, you know, maybe, maybe we were looking at something a little different from what the hacker perspective of it was. And when we went to go fix it, we fixed the issue and we went down a slightly different path as well. So we fixed, you know, the issue and to the right. And from the hacker perspective, you fix it, you know, we fix the issue and you're looking to the left. So there's actually another issue over there. Um, so that's an opportunity to then find another bug, right? Or, right. you know, might offer a bonus for sending that information back to us. Um, and once, so once you've confirmed the fix, we'll close the report, you get the reputation points, um, and then we'll send it through a review process to uh, determine a bounty. Um, altogether, that, the time that it takes from report to bounty um, is somewhere between 24 hours and 90 days. Um, we skew towards the shorter side of that. It really depends on the, um, how long it, it takes uh, to get to develop the engineering teams to, to fix the issues. Um, but we have pretty rigid uh, deadlines internally. So once, once we start that internal process, um, there's a pretty fixed amount of time that it's going to take. And yeah, sometimes man. when we start to run over that, we'll, we'll send the hacker a message at, right around the 90 day mark. We'll send a message and say, um, hey, it's it's taken a bit longer than we expected to get this fixed. We're going to go ahead and award the bounty right now, even though the issue isn't isn't fully resolved yet. Um, just so you know, it you have that positive experience with us, right? Um, yeah, and it's got to be hard to work with different teams. Just I have the I've had the opportunity to see some of the work that you guys have done internally. You know, just coming to some of the events and internal events that I've been at, and I, it's got to be hard to work with those internal teams when you know you have hundreds of assets and hundreds of things that are under um each asset just yahoo itself is massive but now being under the verizon media brand it's not just yahoo anymore there is all these different um sub companies or assets that also belong to the company you guys have to find the right owner find the right developer find the right team that's in charge of that asset or that project to get things fixed and it's great to see you guys communicate that with the hackers i know uh, back in I don't even know. It was November when we did uh, LA. You guys had that giant, um, f you know, flow chart of some sort that took up an entire projector to show that had like you know that everything that happens from when it's a P one or a P zero all the way to a P four and the life cycle of it. And you know, hearing you talk about that, it's great to you know for hackers to understand. There's a lot going on in the background than um, what they see happening on a triage ticket, right? Yeah, and one of the things we've worked with Hacker One recently is to provide some feedback about ways that reports could be more transparent to the hackers about what's going on when when you don't see any movement, right? Uh, a lot, there's there's this comments chain um, that that shows up, and it's it's different when you look at it from the program side versus the hacker side. You don't mm -hmm. see some of that private communication between the triage team and the program. 
Um, and you also don't see some of the, there's a bunch of uh, private fields like um, uh, the, the internal reference, if, you know, if, if we have a, an internal ticket identifier on there or not. Um, so there's a lot of these different changes that can happen to a ticket that when we look at it, it's, it's obviously moving. I think we're making progress, things are ticking forwards. But when you look at it from a hacker perspective, you can't see a lot of those updates and it feels really stale. It's, it's, um, it's kind of disheartening probably, right? Yeah. Um, so we've, we've talked to them, uh, to the HackerOne engineering team about, uh, and, and they're working on ways to improve that with transparency. I mean, not to share all of the information, but at least to show some bumps to the hackers so that you know that things are progressing, that there has been activity um, when, that's, when that's appropriate to share that kind of information. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you but two yeah, more things before uh, I let you go. These are mostly for hackers. I want to kind of uh, hear from you pretty much. Um, the first thing is, what do you recommend for hackers who are just getting started with the Verizon Media Bug Bounty Program? To what kind of vulnerabilities do you look for to maximize their, their bounties for their efforts? That sounds like a loaded question. <laughs> is it mostly uh, like core assets should be uh, prioritized or should be, you know, more on the server side vulnerabilities, combination of both? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so so we've we've put a lot of effort into trying to make our, our policy page, our program policy page, um, have a ton of information in it. And the result of that is that there it's it's like a thirty or forty page document. If you wanted to go print that out, it's enormous. Um, that, so there's, there's trouble with that in that it is so long, it's hard to dig into it and, and kind of digest it. Um, a couple of the key things to look in there though, are, are check out the rules, make sure that you understand those. Um, we do have six rules of engagement, um, that focuses on stuff like don't share the data. If you find anything, um, you don't be breaking things intentionally, right. you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and then, so, so, so check out the rules first. Look at the bounty table. Um, we've broken down the, the CWE classifications, the, the common weakness enumerations. Um, we classify all of our bugs into a, a set of CWEs. So, so look at those because we've tracked the CWEs that we're most interested in against um, a, a low, medium, high critical kind of severity range. And you can double check that against a low, medium, high bounty range. And then the t common types of bugs that fall into those. So, um, you know, cross-site scripting, there's like seven different varieties of cross-site scripting, right? We've got DOM, stored, um, re reflected. Uh, there's self-XSS, which is pretty low on the totem pole. Blind. Um, blind, short, blind. <laughs> um, right, there's uh, uh, CSS injection. is actually, it's technically a cross-site scripting. It's a CWE 79, mm -hmm. um, right? It, it falls into that category. Um, so, so, you know, we, we've, we've got that all laid out in the table. So, you know, start to dig through that, understand the OWASP top 10 is really the, the best way to, to get started on a, on a, any kind of bounty program is if you understand that list and those vulnerabilities, you should be able to look at the policy page and, and figure out, um, if I find one of those vulnerabilities, what can I expect in terms of, um, severity and bounty, right. um, but then the next thing is, is where do you go hunt? So we've, we've got a very long list of targets, assets that are in scope, as well as a long list of things that are out of scope, because we do have an enormous company history spanning over 75 years of the internet. You know, when, when you look at the brands and things and how long they've been around, um, some of those brands have been sold, some things have been purchased, some things have been decommissioned. Um, so, you know, before you go start hunting on something, double check that it is in the in scope section and not the out of scope section. Uh, we try to keep that list complete and exhaustive, um, but you know, with so many things, it's it's kind of hard to to keep that 100% all the time. It's pretty nearly there, but uh, but not quite. Yeah. Um, I, I do want to address one thing I saw in chat here. Um, we're we're the Verizon Media program. Verizon Media. Span, it covers the advertising and content businesses inside of Verizon. So things like Huffington Post, AOL, Yahoo, um, some of the, the CDN, uh, Edgecast, and uh, the Uplink properties, things like that. Um, if you remember, the company used to be called Oath. Um, it does not cover things like Verizon Wireless and Verizon.com. There's a different set of, different portion of the business that focuses 
on uh, on that section of, of bug bounty. So we're paranoids are focused on Verizon Media. Yeah. And then one last thing uh, before I let you go, we're almost out of time. A few more minutes. Any advice you have to give uh, the hackers that are just getting started outside of the bounty and dupes and stuff like that? Anything that uh, you think would be very valuable for people that are watching this to walk away? Any word of wisdom, advice uh, that you want to um, end it on? Uh, you know, end the conversation with. It it's hard. Um, security security is is hard. Uh, it, just stick with it. You know, um, some some of the best hackers have picked a particular vulnerability and they dive really deep on that one thing. They really understand how that works. Um, and they're able to identify that pretty quickly because they understand how that vulnerability works and how that might exist in different languages, different technologies and platforms. Um, just because you're not finding anything when you've spent an hour, 10 hours, 20 hours, doesn't mean you're not going to find um, the most valuable thing that we've ever seen when you get to hour 21 or 10 minutes after you decided to quit, right? You could be right there. So just because you haven't found anything, don't be disheartened, um, which which goes to the next point um, that I, I don't think is said enough. Don't quit your day job mm -hmm. until you are certain that you can maintain a bug bounty life uh, because it's there's ups and downs. It is very stressful for a lot of people, uh -huh. um, but it should be fun. It should be something that you enjoy doing. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, bug bounties are definitely a grind. Not that you won't be able to make um, a good living off of it, but you can't just quit your job and expect it to happen. Um, you know, you got to get good at what you're doing and be comfortable that you'll be able to survive and pay your bills uh, if you do want to do this full time. Um, it's really, really good advice. Um, but yeah, thank you so much again. This is uh, your Chris Holtz. People that don't know, um, thank you so much, man, for being here. I appreciate you and. Uh, if you have anything else to say, we'll cut this up and we'll go back to our uh, to the next portion of the program. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, if you guys see me on uh, on reports, my my hacker one handle is flying toasters. Well, we do have a flying toasters emote on my channel. So chat, please make sure you use that emote say, to say thank you to Chris for being here. I again, thank you man so much. I appreciate you being here and we'll talk soon. All right. Thanks for having me. All right, that was Chris Holtz. Again, thank you so much for being here and uh, showing us what it looks like to be a part of a bug bounty program from a management perspective rather than a hacker. Um, so thank you so much. And I think a lot of people that have hacked on the bug bounty program with Verizon Media are more than likely familiar with um, your name as Flying Toaster. So for the next portion of this, um, what we are going to do is I have some slides and um, not a whole lot, eight slides and some um, CTFs we're going to try. I'm going to try and multitask really quickly and see if I can uh, load up the screen on this side. Cool. So we're going to look at a vulnerability type. Um, I think when I say I door everybody is more than likely familiar with it it's one of the more on the easier side vulnerabilities that are still being found on uh, bug bounty programs and other um, companies as well so we're going to uh, do a quick review of idor and uh, if we have time i'm going to pull up the hacker 101 website and we can go through uh, some of the uh, ctfs that cover idor uh, so let's switch over again Cool. And again, all of this stuff that I'm showing, a lot of these videos are available on Hacker 101. So if I speak too fast or if I don't cover something quick enough or you're not sure, drop me a question. And if it's still not answered, just remember all this content is free on Hacker101.com. And you can go and uh, look at these online on your own. They're 100% free. Uh, this is just a shorter version of these as well. So the first thing is before we talk about becoming a becoming familiar with idor you want to understand the hacker mindset um a big thank you to cody brocious aka dakin uh, if you're not familiar with cody uh, you can follow them on twitter uh, at dakin but they came up with this uh button thing that says do not press this bug button it's a shiny red button again do not press and the best way to explain the hacker mindset is to actually ignore that advice and do press the button that shiny red button and making sure that 
you see the behavior that it's going to have. You want to see how it reacts. What are the end results? You know, what is it going to do when you push the button? And why do they not want you to push this shiny big button that's in front of you? And hacking is a lot of the hacking thing is the same thing of thinking why. Why is this thing not working this way? Why is it not supposed to do these things? What happens if it does these things? So everything that's given to you from a website, it should always be questioned, especially if you're looking at an IDOR. So an IDOR is an insecure direct object reference. It's when a user provided input directly controls a lookup of something on the server and it's missing authorization that could lead to an IDOR. In other words, you change some sort of a user input that the, the website takes from you. And once you change that, it's going to spit out information that belongs to another user where you're not supposed to have access to. So how does that look? This is actually a bug report by Sean Melia, aka Meals, uh, awesome hacker. If you don't know Sean, uh, look him up on Twitter as well. Uh, his name is uh, Sean Meals. He should pop up immediately. But one of the bugs that he found, um, you can also read the report by going to this link, is he had this order. He actually made an order online on this Bit Studio, uh, Buy Studio, B Studio, whatever you want to call it. And he realized that the order has a numerical number so every time you make a new order this number goes up by one digit so the next order from 793 would be 794 795 and so on so here is where you can actually change the numerical number here uh, you can decrease or increase it by one and immediately it would give you access to another person's order if you're asking why that is important, you know, who cares if they're seeing someone else's order? But if you think about it from a security perspective, right? That is because a an order could have someone's address, someone's full name, someone's uh, phone number, their email address, lots of private information that you may not want to have out there accessible for everybody to have. Um, and it also shows what they have ordered. In some cases, it has four digits of the um, credit card number and it gives you a lot of data and i see someone in chat uh, x score is saying that you can harvest that absolutely it's a it's a really easy way to harvest data but this is just orders right this could happen in other areas of the website as well this could be things like seeing another user's api key seeing their messages seeing anything that has a numerical id attached to it so you want to make sure um, if you see an id of some sort you change it up and it's not always as, an, uh, as easy as just an integer like this one. There's times where they have done some quote unquote encoding of some sort or encryption is what they want to call it. It could be base 64. It could be in the cookie. It could be in a header. It could be things that are not fully visible in the URL address bar, uh, but it still could be manipulated. And it doesn't always have to be reading content, like reading someone's order or reading someone's user data that doesn't belong to you. In a lot of cases, you could also be able to modify that that data. So this could be, for example, changing your profile and changing your email address on your profile it has a numerical ID. You can change that ID and it would change it to your email address. So you always think of that. Deleting stuff is another one. It doesn't have to be modifying or reading it. It could also be that you go and delete your account. Uh, the request sends a, you know, the, the site sends a request saying delete. And then this is a user ID. You change the user ID to another ID and boom, it happens. The best way to do IDOR, and this is one of the things that I highly recommend anybody that's looking for IDORs to do, is when you want to look for them, create two accounts. And account one is your target, and account two is the attacker, and you attack the different user IDs. And that's because you don't want to accidentally modify a user's data and make him lose information. In a lot of cases, if you do that, if you end up doing that, then you may not get your bounty. You may go out of scope because you know, you've know you modified the data from another user where you didn't have the permission to do so. So always keep that in mind. I see questions about uh, session management and that sort of stuff. Yeah, you can absolutely take over an account if you have an IDOR in the profile where you can change a password and email address. But IDOR doesn't mean it's a account takeover. It doesn't mean it's a, a session problem. There's also something about access control. Um, access control could be different. Uh, when you're talking about access control, that could be Vulns for where, for example, you are not able to, as a as a lower user, you need to have admin user to uh, access particular data or particular endpoints. And that's when um, you're dealing with access control vulnerabilities. Either it's its own vulnerability type. It could lead to information disclosure. It could lead to access control and that sort of stuff. Um, but again, it's its own vulnerability type. 
um, that should be looked at separately than the other ones that I mentioned. So again, I talked about this a little bit, but quick review. If you see a seven digit number, or it doesn't have to be seven digit, if you see any integers, you can always subtract and add one. Again, this is not the best way to do it, but um, if you're not sure, if it's, you know, if you see that the IDs are not integers, just go ahead and make another account and get the ID for that user and swap it out. You can do that with burp. Um, we'll talk about that later, hopefully. Anytime you see something labeled ID, anything user ID, doc ID, program ID, Anything that has ID or, again, anything that could indicate to be an ID, definitely try it out. And as I mentioned, uh, I can't stress this one enough. Please, please, please always try to resort to making two accounts and test them against each other. And also make sure you check for hidden fields. Um, also, a lot of times when you see stuff in the DOM, that could be helpful to know what to do. And, of course, check, uh, check for IDs in the IHX calls. Um, this could be, a again, a... Thank you so much for the sub. That's a little loud a little bit. But this could also be uh, things like uh, post request, post request, put request, and delete request. So don't limit yourself just to whatever you see in the address bar at the top. Even though it's the easiest way to find them, I'm not saying they're not valuable. But if you limit yourself there, you're losing out on more and more vulnerabilities. And the remediation, pretty easy. Just... Um, uh, make sure that you limit people to um, what their session has access to and check that that object actually belongs to them and they're actually um, able to see it or have the permission to see it. Uh, I see the question coming in chat that someone is asking me if, as a beginner, I recommend you to look for IDORs. Absolutely. Um, IDORs are pretty fairly simple. All you have to do is understand how an HTTP request works if you're not familiar with that um, i'm going to drop you a link it's uh, in the beginners link you can go in there and look at, look at the basics link in the basics it talks about learning uh, http headers what an http request is and so on you really have to understand those to under, you know to understand what a put and post requests are and what a delete request is and how to look for them so what we're going to do now is we're going to log into Hacker101.com and if you have a Hacker1 account, you should be easily uh, able to access this. So I'm going to switch my screen really quickly so I can log into my account. But once we do log in, um, I'm going to play with one of the um, levels called Postbook and that one actually has a lot of... Uh, it actually has a lot of... Uh, I doors from what I remember. So let me log in really quickly. And again, if you don't have a Hacker One account or if you want to follow along, it should be pretty easy. All you have to do is uh, log into your Hacker One account, and I'm going to show how that works. So let's switch over here. So once you log into your account on Hacker One, uh, this is what it looks like. This is one of the accounts that I made just for today. And we're going to go to hacker101.com and we're going to click on CTF. And clicking login is going to ask you to log in with your Hacker One account and you have to give it the permission to log in, which should be fairly easy. Cool, there it is. So here is Postbook. So again, if you want to follow along, you're more than welcome to. If you do get stuck, there is hints. You can actually click on get a hint. It will tell you how to find flag zero if you haven't found it yet. It will go down that list. And if anything breaks at some point, you can also push restart and get it to reboot and give you a fresh new instance. And keep in mind that every time you do um, you do some of these levels, if you get 26 points, you get a private invite where you can hack on an exclusive private program on Hacker One. Um, and also learn how to you know some do some of this stuff as well. So this is the post book. I'm going to make a new account as they want us to. Just to make things easier, I'm going to boot up Burp Suite. You don't need Burp for this. Uh, I'm going to try and do some of this stuff with Burp uh, without Burp to show why you don't need to um, really use Burp Suite. But it doesn't hurt to have it. So I'm just gonna quickly set up my target and make sure it only intercepts things that are coming from this IP address. So it's only stuff that's in the target scope. In my target scope, I added this IP address. So now, from now on, it should only um, intercept that, um, the requests that come from this website. Let's make sure that our um, proxy is off. Cool, so we're going to sign up for a user. 
and then we're going to log in to this set user so as you can see by logging into postbook um, it looks like a blog it looks like some sort of a, a blogging system so if you click on this and since we just talked about IDOR, you can see right here, this is the folder where our CTF is hosted. Anything before index doesn't matter here. Um, this is a part of CTF, but everything after that folder is what we need. And right here it shows ID is three. As a hacker, the first thing that I do is just immediately change that out. And by just decreasing that by one, we can say it gives us a flag. And this is supposed to be secret. It's supposed to be uh, someone's diary. We're not supposed to access it. It's the admin's diary. Um, you want to make sure that um, you check that out. So by just changing it from two, uh, from three to a two, it gave us a flag. And if you've never played with the Hacker 101 platform, all you have to do is go in here and put in your flag. And if the flag is valid, it will tell you I've found the flag. Your number of points go up by however much that was worth. And it gets you closer to your next invite as well. So, and if we refresh this, I think the hint's going to be shown. So we found flag one. And it says to, you can view your own. So if I couldn't figure this out and I asked for a hint, it would tell me that try viewing your own post and then see if you can change the ID. But there's got to be more than just that, right? This can't just be the only way to do it. But let's make a post and see what it looks like. We're going to say hello from Nahamseg and the paranoid. And we're going to make that post. We can see that this is a post we created. There's also an edit, so I can actually edit my own post. And again, there's an edit.php and it's giving us an ID right here, it's an integer. But if we go back, delete also does something. Uh, oops, we shouldn't have deleted it, let's make another post. So if you look at the address bar, I know it's hard to see it, but if you look at the address bar down below, let me copy paste it actually, there we go. So right here you can see that the ID is different. It's no longer an integer, but it doesn't mean that it's fully uh, locked down against an IDOR. So let's focus on editing first. So I've made this one already. I'm going to edit this ID5. ID4 was ours. So if we go to it, because I deleted it, it's probably not going to be shown uh, because it's a post that doesn't exist. But it kind of shows you that it's still taking our user value and spitting out more stuff uh, than it should. But let's decrease this by one more. Doing three, doing two. What about we do an ID one? Nope. We we'll keep going. Um, there's going to be times where you may have to use something like Burp Suite uh, because you know because some of the IDs may be deleted depending on how old the site is. You can do this with Intruder. If you're not really familiar with Intruder, you can actually I'll show how it works. But you can tell Intruder to look for a very very large number of um, different things so it could be numbers it could be letters it could be brute forcing for whatever you need it to do uh someone wants to do the id zero let's try it nothing on id zero i think this was a large number uh, of some sort um let me see let me do the math really quick i think the large number for this one is like in the 900s so i'm going to go in here knowing that it's in the 900s i'm going to let's see i'm going to go to proxy i'm going to make sure i capture this and I'm going to send it to Intruder by doing Control I or Command I if you're on the Mac. We can also go here and say uh, send it to Intruder somewhere here. Um, send to Intruder right here. So you can do that and it will send it to this tab right here. You can go to position. This is what you want to brute force. So if you wanted to brute force just the ID number here. Let's clear it. Oops. I want to just brute force this thing. I'm going to add a payload. And in my payloads, I just want to do numbers. These are the different things you can do, um, but I only care for numbers. So here it's going to tell you, hey, do you want to do random or do you want to do a sequence? I want to do um, anywhere from 920 to 999. Hopefully these are the right numbers. Uh, hopefully I don't get owned on this stream, but we're going to tell it to start attack. But because I'm using a free version of uh, Burp Suite, I'm going to let this go for a while. Uh, until it's done and we can see the as you can see right now the length of the request for all of them is coming back as so our original request was to send it to id zero the content length for that is 1917 so that means that's how um, anything that's invalid is going to come up as that 
So if we do hit a right number that has a vulnerability or does have information that's not the same as ID zero, aka it's not invalid, that length is going to change because it's going to have more information like a flag within it. But while it does that, let's go back to uh, working on the delete thing. So if we go back to one of these posts, where is it? There we go. So if I wanted to make a new post, and if I were to say I want to delete this, this value right here, the ID is no longer a numerical ID. And I want to understand what this is. You can either Google for it. Uh, you can see it's an MD5. It says it's a reverse already. You can also use other tools um, to find out what kind of hash it is. But you can see that this is the same as ID6. And if we go back to our original post, we can see that this post, when you edit it, it's also pointing to ID6. So with deleting something, it shows us um, this ID. When it wants to delete, it shows us an MD5 of the value 6. But if you want to edit it, it gives you the integer for 6. So if we wanted to delete someone's post, uh, so let's say if I wanted to delete this one, this is ID3. We're going to create an MD5 generator. We're going to find one online. And we are going to throw this in here and generate an MD5 for post three. And instead of instead of deleting our post, so I'm gonna copy that number. Uh, I'm just gonna throw it in here really quickly. This is the ID for three. I'm gonna copy the link for deleting and I'm gonna swap out the ID six for ID three. And you can see it deleted the, the post that was down here and it gave us another flag. So let's go here again go to our submit flag and click check. And sure enough, that's another valid flag, 17 out of 26. How are we doing chat? Is that, am I going too fast, going too slow? And it looks like this isn't over yet. Um, let's see if we can get a hint. I have two more minutes before, um, I have two more minutes before I have to cut this short. So let's go to our CTF right here and get a flag. Uh, hopefully give me the flag that I want, but who knows at this point. So this is still doing its thing. Uh, it hasn't given us what we want. So let's get a hint. Uh, well, I don't want to do that one. Can I get one more hint? I already did this one. Okay, so 1890, no, what? 189 times 5 is... 945 did we miss 945 let's see so let's go back to edit okay that's not the case so maybe i'm wrong there isn't another flag here but this is how the idors work you just have to understand how an application works uh look at the dom see if there's any other places where an id is being called uh you want to really really understand how things work uh, before you start digging into the application to find more vulnerabilities so now that we know a little bit about IDOR, uh, for the next section of the seminar, um, I want to talk about actually getting started with bug bounties. So uh, before I do get started, I would love to hear from everybody watching this. Let me know, are you currently signed up on any bug bounty platforms? Uh, have you found the vuln? Even if it's a duplicate that counts, I kind of want to understand where everybody is and um, to where what where we focus on. So let me know in the chat, um, what is your experience like? Are you in a bug bounty platform already? That's a great start. And have you found any vulnerabilities? Just Hacker One, yes. Sign up on Hacker One, but no bugs. Yes, I'm on bug crowd on Hacker One. Hacker One, haven't pulled the trigger yet. That's okay. There's always time. You just got to put your mind to it. On hacker one but i'm new signed up no bugs i see it it's all good everybody has been there everybody that's the, the first step is to take the initiative to sign up on the platform and familiarize yourself and hopefully with the stuff that i'm going to show you all uh, it will make things a little bit easier so let's go to hackerone.com um let's do this instead so if you are a new hacker to hacker one again there are numbers of platform out there i personally hack on hacker one and i spend a little bit of time on platforms like bar crowd and integrity if i have the time or the right programs to hack on but again the, the choice of platform doesn't really make a difference i just personally enjoy hacking on hacker one more because i have had a long history with them and of course i'm biased because i work for hacker one 
Uh, but again, Integrity, Buckcrowd, um, and Synac, all great platforms. Uh, you're welcome to pick and choose what you want to hack on. Find a bug bounty platform that works for you and stick to it and build a reputation on that platform. So when you sign up for HackerOne, you can go here and create an account. Uh, you Obviously, if you want to be a hacker, you want to sign up as a hacker. And you will sign up, give them your name, username, password. And I think you have to confirm your email once uh, it's over. But yeah, that's how you do it. You log in. And once you log in, it puts you here, which is your uh, hacker dashboard is what we call it. The hacker dashboard is where you see all of your progress, all of the things you have done. Let me push this over here. There we go. This is where you can see um, next steps, uh, your programs, your invites, your opportunities with the platform itself. So when you go to uh, your hacker dashboard, you have the overview. Um, this is not my real account, but um, you can kind of see what it will show you. It will show you the number of bugs you have found, low, medium, critical. It will show you your staff for 90 days, the past year, and all time. And then, of course, it tells you to earn points on the Capture the Flag on Hacker 101 to score your first invite. Um, it also shows you all the different vones you have found and the submission numbers. These are all obviously testing. Um, they're the test reports that I've created um, that I was doing something for a stream early on. The next tab is my programs. This is where you see your invitations. I'm going to pull this over here because I just realized it might show me a private program, but let me see. Nope, nothing yet. Cool. I just want to make sure. So this is where it shows you your private programs. Remember, the private programs are not meant to be talked about publicly. It's mostly for you to be able to know what programs you have access to. Um, and yes, I see someone asking about learning about reporting. We'll definitely talk about that in a little bit as well. And I may actually go to some of my old reports that I did for another stream. There were um, These were just fake reports that I made hacking on a fake application. So I'll talk about them a little bit as well. Retesting. Uh, some companies may ask you to retest a bug that they have fixed. Uh, you can look at them here. You can actually follow hackers. So if let's say if I'm a regular user on the platform and I wanted to follow some of the hackers that I see on the directory, there's a button right here you can say follow. Um, I wanted to look at them, whatever it is. You can also go to Hacktivity to find more hackers. We'll talk about Hacktivity in a little bit when we talk about resources. But if you see a hacker here you like, um, let's see, I like to follow Hanoki. Great hacker. I'm going to right here and push follow. And now if I go to my followed hackers, it will show me their links. Uh, you can click on their profiles and see what kind of vulnerabilities they have done. You know, if they have any vulnerabilities that have been published like this one so i have this is my latest one and we'll go to disclose this will be everything that i've found on hacker one that has been disclosed on hacker one uh and you can kind of read through it and understand how they have done and you can see i'm very open about this i have no reason not to be you can see the progress i've made from writing these short reports with nothing in them to all the way um for example to here where i wrote this giant report on how this vulnerability worked so you can also kind of learn from that as well but speaking of activity uh hacktivity is one of your greatest tools of all time that you could ever ever rely on and there's a why i say that it's you get to learn from other folks who have just gotten big bounties like this one has take over an account it doesn't have a shopify id and more twenty two thousand dollars for this bounty so you get to see who they are at the top you can see what the criticality was you can see who was involved on the Shopify end and on the hacker end. Big shout out to Peter Jaworski. We'll talk about him a little bit as well. Um, but you can read this details of this. The details. You go here. You go to admin. You can be exploited. You do this. These are the steps to reproduce it. This is the impact. And they also have a video you can watch understanding how everything has worked. And you can kind of see the interaction that the customer has had with this company. Or with this hacker. I'm sorry. So uh, you, I would say abuse this read everything you can so you can see that this person has disclosed another vulnerability eight days ago 14 days ago you get to see there's a pattern of owning or finding vulnerabilities on shopify's website so that's just one hacker but if you keep scrolling and scrolling you can see there's other stuff here there is an rce in the desktop app and there's a bonus uh you can see what this rce was you can read the steps the technical aspects of it a lot of folks like to put um screenshots in there and so on reading these i know it doesn't make sense maybe in some cases but believe me there's going to be when you read these in the back of your mind you're going to have the knowledge that 
you you've seen this somewhere oh i remember the slack bug that was similar to this thing oh my god i'm gonna go read that and see if it could help me um you know learn how to exploit this bug that i'm looking at so think about that stuff um i know sometimes it's hard but you don't understand it. if you don't understand something look for it so if you don't understand what um one of the keywords here you see something like you know i don't understand what it, it's json file is for example uh, go look for json if you don't know what json is you have to look it up it's not that um there's json is not a complicated thing to learn there's going to be things that are more complicated but then you understand okay for me to understand this vulnerability type or for me to discover a vuln similar to this one i need to learn x y and z so this is a very good powerful tool to uh look i monitor this very regularly there's a lot of good villains on here that you can read uh and every program that's open to it if you want to specifically learn about gitlab and not just you know random vulnerabilities you can also do the same thing so you can go to gitlab and this is what their bug bounty program looks like but you can go to their activity and look at all of the disclosed bugs that they have ever disclosed on the platform uh, currently from seven days ago and you can see how much the bounty was and that sort of stuff but speaking of bug bounty programs i want to kind of talk about how to pick a bug bounty program and how to understand their policies how are we doing on time okay not bad not bad let me make sure i'm on time still cool we have another eight minutes to talk about this so the first thing is you want to understand if this bug bounty program pays anything or not um if you are a new bug hunter i highly recommend um i know that it's hard to say no to the money but i highly recommend doing vulnerability disclosure programs because when there's bounty involved there's more people looking at these bug bounty programs and there's going to be uh, there's probably i'm not saying it's going to be impossible but it's going to be more difficult to find vulnerabilities because you have to dig deeper so if you're brand new you want to learn how to hack I highly recommend for you to actually go through a program that's a little bit newer and uh, doesn't have as many vulnerabilities or as many eyes on it. But again, that choice is yours. I'm going to cover both of them. Uh, one of my favorite bug bounty programs, let's actually pull this up. Uh, let's go to Hacker Dashboard and look at our programs. And let's make them public. Let's go to directory now. So in the directory, you can filter by uh, whether you want to get a bug bounty program or if you want to get a, uh, I, if you're a mobile hacker, if you're an Android hacker, if you're a source code review person, hardware, whatever, you can decide what you want to hack on. So here I could go, I want to do any assets. I want it to be obviously active program. If you want to deal with, if you want to work with a program that hacker one triage is for, you can click that or you can unclick it, whatever you want to do, that's up to you. But also the offers bounty. This is where you can click on it and it says, hey, show me all the programs that want that offer a monetary uh, bonus or monetary bounty. And you can see how much. The minimum bounty is 50. You can sort by this as well. Uh, let's see where it goes. So you can see the Pearl Internet Bug Bounty Program gives you a minimum of $1,000. Uh, GitHub gives you 600. Hacker One is 500. You can see the average and so on. I recommend for new hackers, I always recommend... Uh, three different programs uh, gm.com actually let's go gm that didn't work so let's just go directly to general motors maybe that's why there we go general motors a huge bug bounty program they don't pay a whole lot but it gives you a playing field that not a whole lot of people are looking at because there's no money involved and the bug bounty program itself is incredibly huge so let's look at the guidelines you know, they obviously don't have to, you can't cause harm to GM or their customers. You have to provide them information and you don't compromise the privacy of other users. Uh, you have to read these to make sure you're staying uh, in, you know, you're, you're staying within the terms of this bug bounty program. Understand what is out of scope. These are the things you do not want to look for. So if you're using scanners, you're using, you're relying on scanners, don't do it. It's not worth it. Learn these things to do them manually. The more you rely on scanners, the less you're going to uh, learn and that was an advice that was given to me f during my first year of bug bounties and I ignored it um, And then I realized later on that do using scanners isn't gonna do me any justice uh, the human brain does a lot of a better job than um, a Scanner can do and then also look they, can't, you know, they, they don't want to see CSRF for 
things that aren't that valuable. They don't care about TLS. They don't care about DMARC. They don't care about open redirects. They don't care about publicly accessible login panels, click jacking, content spoofing, and text injection. For GM's case, um, it looks like they want to hack on anything that's owned by GM. So that could be any brand that's under the GM site. Uh, but they're not the only company that does this. There's also uh, two other companies that I enjoy uh, recommending to people. One is IBM. Um, they also have a huge, huge bug bounty program. Same thing. If you're going to hack on them, make sure you click on their policy. You look at the scope. So this one has a defined scope that says the program is limited to exploitable security vulnerabilities and CVEs found in IBM products, offering services and websites. So again, it's another company that's saying, hey, find vulnerabilities in any of our assets and we'll acknowledge you for it. We don't offer a bounty, but we'll acknowledge you and put you on a leaderboard here that says thank you for finding a vuln on IBM. Um, so that's how you can decide what you want to hack on. And then, of course, a third one, which is I think everybody's favorite is the Department of Defense. Um, if I can find it, the U.S. Department of Defense who doesn't want to hack the U.S. government legally and take some bragging rights? So we can go here. Again, the DOD scope is also the same thing. Any publicly facing website owned, operated, or controlled by the DOD, including web applications, hosts on those sites. So any military website or anything under the DOD sites are in the scope of this bug bounty program. So those are the things that I recommend. But if you wanted to pick a program outside of those, what I would recommend is, again, go into the directory, First of all, be honest with yourself and be very open to what you're good at and what you're not good at. So if you're not good at iOS or you're not good at Android, you're not good at Windows stuff, don't click those. Just stick to any or go to domain. So these are everything that has a domain in scope. So I'm going to pick a random one. Let's see, Wells Fargo. And so we can tell that there's no bounty being paid here. There's no indication of it. But if we scroll down, they tell you what's in scope. So they have WF.com, Wells Fargo.com, Wells Fargo Advisors. So these are all in scope, but there's no bounty for it. And if we scroll down, the sh usually if there is something out of scope, they will have this, you know, they would say out of scope assets and they will put them there. But unfortunately for this one, they don't. Let's look at GitLab's really quickly. So GitLab again has customer, you know, getter, registry. API, WS, your own instance, and they tell you what's out of scope. These are all eligible, obviously. They will give you money because they're, you know, they pay a bounty for it. But the out of scope, out of scope stuff is about dashboard, alerts, support, form. These are all the things that you should not hack or touch when it comes down to. If you do accidentally find something, again, and <laughs> thank you, Bitcoin. But if you do find something on accident, you should report it, but not expect any bounty. Be very open and honest about it. Say, hey, I was looking at your assets. I click on this link. It took me to this website. I, you know, I found this vulnerability. Later on, I realized that it was out of scope. I'm sorry, but I just want to make sure I report this for you guys to get it fixed. And I've never seen a company say no to a vulnerability. In a lot of cases, the company may say, thank you. You know, since you've been honest, here's a small bonus for your time. It's not always going to happen, but if you're honest and you build that relationship with them, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't hurt to kind of give them the vulnerabilities and see where it takes you. So that's kind of how uh, you can pick your bug bounty programs, the skill sets, um, the bounty type, if you want to pay for a bounty or if you want it to be a non-bug bounty program and that sort of stuff. You can filter all of those here as well. And when you look at a bug bounty program, on the right-hand side, there are some really, really important metrics. I'm going to pull up Verizon Media's program uh, with the Paranoids. So Verizon obviously has a very big bug bounty program. This list of scope is huge. So pretty much everything yahoo.com, everything Moloch, however you say that, Yahoo APIs, Athens, uh, you name it. This is all in scope. They tell you very, very specifically what's in scope and what's not in scope and they link you to it. But they also tell you specifically at the bottom, so Huffington Post is in scope, Omega's in scope. You can see the auto scope stuff here. These are not in scope for this website. So if you go to this site, this is in scope. This is not in scope. So you make sure you read all these. Make sure you see what's critical. If an asset is marked as not critical, then you know that they're not going to pay as much. Critical means the highest bounty you would get is critical. But if it's medium, then it means the highest bounty you get is medium because that particular asset isn't that critical to the bug bounty program. 
If you scroll to the outer scope for Yahoo, you can see yahoo.net, yahoo.com.tw, you know, Yahoo Cricket, Yahoo Messenger, Yahoo 7, all these different ones, Yahoo Business, everything here is listed out of scope. So always, always, always make sure you read those before you get started. But now as a hacker, you value these things as well. The response efficiency is very important because you want to understand, okay, if I am hacking on this bug bounty program, when are they going to reply to me? Is this a program that I want to hack on? What are the chances of me not getting a response? So you want to make sure you understand all of those before you get started. Um, so here it shows that an average day respond immediately within five hours, which is freaking awesome because at least in five hours, you will know that um, you will know something from, you know, you will hear something from the company. Um, you know, you can hear something from the company within five hours. It also tells you how long it takes to validate. Triage means that I validated, they started the process of validation. It takes about three years. Um, it's about three days for you to hear back whether this was a valid or they're going to investigate it, if it's something of importance or not. And uh, they take about two months. This doesn't mean that it takes two months right away. The, the same thing with the five hours and the three-day thing. It doesn't mean that it's going to be right on the dot. But the average for everybody else in the last 90 days has been two months to get a bounty after the bug was validated. And of course, 97% of the reports have met their response standards. And if you're not familiar with those, you can read them here. We hold, uh, HackerOne holds companies to a standard. If it don't fit that standard, that number will drop. It's a good indication of hacking on the program or not. So always keep, keep a lookout on those. And at the bottom of that, you can see other stuff. For example, you can see the, st uh, the stats for um, what this bug bounty program looks like. So how much are they... Uh, pretty much how much are they paying to hackers so the minimum bounty for Verizon Media is 50 I personally haven't seen a lot of $50 bounties come out of Verizon Media because of you know everything that you people have found on Verizon Media has been incredibly awesome I haven't seen $50 in a while but that's the minimum that they're willing to pay so if you find something super low on the CVSS and uh, impact uh, scale you may get $50 if they decide to change it. And of course, I've paid almost $11 million in bounties. And the average bounty is very important. That means on average, each vulnerability that's coming into this bug bounty program has in between $400 to $500. So if you find something of a low-ish, medium-ish um, impact, you can expect about four to $500. This is when you know how much you might get paid. And of course, the top bounty has been 5000 to 40000 So depending on how impactful it is, you may get more and more money so this shows you the absolute best case for you if i find a vulnerability that completely owns this company what's the most i can get so based on this number forty thousand is the most you could expect that number could go higher or lower depending on what you find and these are the rest of them are, are important to know but it's not that um life-changing this one is very important because you can see that if 675,000 has been pinned in the last 90 days, that indicates that there are more vulnerabilities to be found. You can find more vulnerabilities. Others have found more and you may have a higher chance. But if that number is $50 and the company is very active, it shows you, okay, you might have to invest more time to find a vulnerability. And there's nothing wrong with a challenge and challenging yourself to want to hack on a program uh, that's more difficult. And you can also see who are the top hackers. Big shout out to Mark Litchfield. I know you're watching this. He's currently a paranoid himself. Uh, he's working with Verizon Media. But you can also see who are some of the top hackers. Uh, and you can also see who have, you know how long they've been hacking on this program. Uh, as Chris mentioned, they've been around for since 2013. And you can see these numbers have changed since. In 2013, the number one hacker was different. In 2014, the top 10 has been different. Uh, 2014 and 2015 same thing you can also check and see who's around on this thing and keep going and keep going and going uh, and i see someone mentioning this yes mark no longer hacks on this program um but it's cool to see someone who's you know working on a bug bounty program as a hacker now being on the receiving end of the vulnerabilities and helping verizon media uh build a bug bounty program with everybody else so that was how I would um, pick bug bounty programs. Um, if there aren't, I'm going to open up a little bit of a question. So if anyone has any questions or you want to uh, ask anything about selecting a program or about the metrics, drop them in the chat. Let's see where it goes. And then we'll move on to our next section.
Um, since there aren't any questions coming in, um, I don't see them anything yet. But since we're here, there's a ton of resources for hackers on Hacker One. I talked about Hacktivity. Um, I'm also dropping my beginners list. So if you want to go to that link, there's a lot of good resources out there. Big shout outs to uh, Ash Fox. I don't know if you're watching Ash, but thank you so much for helping maintain that. Um, there are a lot of good resources. Uh, Peter Jaworski has an awesome book. It's called, let's look up Peter Jaworsk, uh, Web Hacking 101. There's a PDF for it on HackerOne. If you're a HackerOne user, uh, you should be able to download it. So if you go here, uh, read about this. Uh, download it. This book is awesome. It talks about all the vulnerabilities that have been found on um, on HackerOne, and he's kind of analyzed them and talked them through in his book. He also has another book. Uh, let me see if I can grab it. This is the other book. I think it's about $30 or something like that. Uh, if you have the money to purchase this, I highly recommend it. It's called the real world bug hunting. Um, it's a similar thing to uh, the PDF that I pulled up, but there's more there's more depth to it, and it's a lot more updated. I highly highly recommend it. And he also has a list of resources at the end of it, I believe. Let me see if I can find it really quickly. There are blogs in here that you can do. So it tells you all the blogs you can read. Let's see. It gives you other resources, uh, videos, uh, reading, exploit databases, bug bounty platforms, uh, and so on. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's a very, very good investment. Um, that and... I don't have it. Oh, there, I do have it. And of course, I think this is something that everybody's already looked at, but if you don't know, is the... Web Application Hacker's Handbook. Uh, this is also $50. Pretty thick, but it shows you how to use Burp Suite. Uh, it's a little bit outdated, but everything that's in here is still relevant. Very, very, very great, great book if you're brand new to this thing. If you get an updated version, it's even better. Uh, but I highly recommend these two books if you're looking for good resources. Now let's talk about reporting. Um, let me pull up my inbox. Let's see. So, when you write a report, these are all, you know, I've, uh, there's this thing called Juice Shop, and I highly recommend anybody watching this to look at it. You can, like, look it up, Juice Shop. Um, it's OWASP Juice Shop. It's an insecure web application. It has a ton of vulnerabilities, including IDOR, XSS, um, tons and tons of good stuff. I highly recommend going in here and looking at it. But once you go in here, uh, you can find those bugs. So I found some bugs, and I want to show you all what kind of information I usually put in my reports. So obviously, there's a description. It's very important to describe what this vulnerability is. For this one, um, the title also is very important. So let's actually let's take a step back and talk about the title. So the title, you want to make sure you specify what the vulnerability type is, what kind of bug did you find. Then you want to mention where it is. So it's an IDOR in this endpoint. And you want to kind of give it a short description of what it lets you do. Okay, there's an IDOR. What's the impact? It allows users to overwrite reviews belonging to other users. Cool. Same thing here. You can say, hey, users are ability, they have the ability to create a review for each item on the website, but the API allows a user to modify reviews that doesn't belong to them. So the next thing is you want to write your POC. You want to kind of talk about you know, how does this vulnerability work? What do we do? You know, how does it, um, how do we reproduce it? What steps did you take? The biggest thing to do is, the way I do my reports is, I pretty much sit there and I, uh, I do each step from logging into the website and then I navigate and I write that down. Thank you, Bitcoin, I appreciate you. So if I navigate down, so if I go in there and I go, okay, I have to click on the item on the shop. I have to collect, you know, I, I selected Apple Juice was the item and that was in Juice Shop. And then I want to write a review and click Submit. Now, if you go to your review and you double click on the edit, intercept the request, this is what the request looks like. Now, you know, all the steps that it takes. If you can't just 
completely forget about the bug. If you can't reproduce this vulnerability just by doing the stuff that you wrote in your POC, the other person on the other end shouldn't. You never assume that the person triaging your vulnerabilities knows more about the product than you do. This could be people that are triage folks on triage teams, on Buck Route, Hacker One, Synac, whatever platform you go to. Um, never assume that they know the product. Treat it as um, treat it as a person that doesn't know or knows as much as you do. So make sure you highlight everything. I usually start with log into your account just so there's no confusions at all. And I recommend doing that so to understand you have to be logged in to make this thing work. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of emergency. All right, so the next thing is, this is an IDOR. So this is how you, um, how I would report every step. So, you know, you change the ID, replace the ID value from step five to blah, blah, blah. And then you go here and you can see that the review belonging to another user was successfully changed. So you have all the steps for it. Um, you know, I also put in the HTTP request that uh, causes the vulnerability. You know, I put REST product reviews right here, and I also put the whole full request in here to show where uh, where the vulnerability is and how it works. The next one is for XSS. Well, for XSS, it's the same thing. You want to make sure that you give them go to this OS juice shop, type in this payload, in the, you know, in the search box. Oh, nice. You have executed JavaScript, but you can also exploit this by going directly to the link. And one of the things that I really like to do for XSS is also include a snippet of the code. So where in the code in the DOM, like just clicking view source, where did this XSS happen? I look for my payload. I copy it and paste it in there. This sometimes helps developers figure out uh, where the vulnerability is and um, how to fix it and where to look for it and that sort of stuff. So always include that. It's always helpful to have it. It doesn't hurt to have screenshots too. I don't do screenshots for some of my phones, but um, you also it's very recommended to do a screenshot. Don't do videos. Videos are a hassle to watch. Do a video for something that's like 20 steps or more. You think it's super complicated. You don't think you're communicating it well enough. Attach it as a supplementary thing and not something that um, you rely on as your first step. Uh, let's see how we're doing on time. Cool. We have a few more minutes uh, before we bring back Chris Holtz uh, for our next portion. So, yeah, there's all these different things you can do. Um, for no brute force protection, same thing. You want to make sure you mention um, the endpoint again and describe what is the, you know, what is the uh, issue that it's having. It doesn't have any protection against brute force. Using a quick list of password, we're able to brute force the admin's login, right? There's a difference between actually being able to brute force someone and actually doing it in theory. The theory is great. You know, there should be a brute force uh, mechanism to, you know, protect the company or the site against brute forcing, but it's not, re it's a theory. You haven't done it in person. You haven't owned an admin login, for example. So you can always report those, but don't expect them to get paid. But for this one was easy. You know, I put an admin, juice shop, password is password. And um, I messed up the markdown again for this one. But you can see I did use brute force, uh, put in the password, blah, blah, blah. And then once you're logged in, I was able to access the administration panel. So you want to make sure you describe some sort of an impact on why this is so important. Why should they get it fixed? If you're giving them something in theory, uh, make sure you describe the impact. If you have a server-side vulnerability, for example, where you're not sure if you want to exploit it more, make sure you uh, you know you say something in the impact statement that hey, you know, even though I showed this vulnerability, I think you can do X, Y, and Z um, using these different methods. Do I have permission to test it out, or could you test it out and let me know if it worked? So keep that in mind. There's a lot of uh, it's very important to communicate throughout your ticket and letting everybody know, uh, letting the other person know uh, the things that you are unsure of. It doesn't hurt to ask. So you can always ask and say, hey, can I exploit this further? And then last but not least, we have this one that says, user are able to assign admin roles to their accounts during sign up. So that kind of means we are escorting our privilege. Oh, same thing again. You want to make sure they can follow it along by giving them your HTTP request, telling them, hey, change the role to admin from whatever it was before. And sending it out and then you're now logging as using you can just create it you can go be an admin and you'll have access to the admin panel so every report that i've done and you guys you have seen so far it's been description proof of concept and the steps to reproduce it and i usually put the impact statement uh, in the poc even though there's an impact section on the uh in the program 
So the other thing that I want to talk about quickly before we move on to the next section is actually writing a report. I kind of covered what stuff I put on there. But when you go to a bug bounty program like this one, uh, this is you know a program. It's called Nahomi's Juice Shop. It's a fake program. You go submit report. It brings this up. And here is where you see more stuff. So you can... This is the first thing I'm going to say. This is the CWE, the weakness, the weakness type that uh, we were talking about earlier. This is where you can mention what kind of bug you have. So if you have an XSS, you type in cross-site scripting. It's a DOM, generic, reflected, stored. If you are reporting an IDOR, whatever you're reporting, you want to put that in there. The next thing is the severity. Be honest with yourself and don't just click on critical because when you put critical on there, they're going to bring it down. It looks better when you... Um, you, be, you build a better relationship with people, especially if it's your first time. Your first impression is very important. So don't always just click on critical because you're used to it. Really think about it. Is this going to affect other users? Is this going to affect multiple users? Is it going to, is it leaking critical information? Is it you know information that's high? If you're not sure how to use CVSS, just click on one of these and select it. But if you want to go the extra step, I highly recommend, especially if you're a hacker one hacker, I really recommend learning how to use CVSS. Uh, there is a link, there's a guide for CVSS. It tells you what it is and how it works. But it's very, very, ex uh, it's very, very easy to use. For bug bounties, since we are going to be doing these on websites, obviously going to be re network, unless you're doing some man in the middle or you have physical access to it. But depending on what you pick, that criticality goes away. So we're gonna click on network. Attack complexity, very self-explanatory. How hard is it to exploit this thing? You know, for an IDOR, it's not that complex. You just increase or decrease it by one, and it works, so it's low. The privilege required, do you have to be logged in? Can you lo can you make an account? Can anybody make an account, or do you have to pay with a credit card? So to have your, you know, it's, it requires some privilege. Do you have to be an admin? Do you have to be, depending on the, you know, the product or the app that you're hacking on, those could change. Uh, so keep that in mind when you are doing this. But for something that's an unauthenticated uh, IDOR, you don't need any privileges, and we can do none. If we, you can, you know, if you can sign up for it without, um, you know, if anybody could sign up for a trial and it gives you that, I still put it as none. But if you have to kind of get invited to an organization, let's say you're using, uh, you know, let's say it's an HR product that you're hacking on and you have to be invited to this thing to be able to use it, then that's low. And if you're an admin, you have to be an admin to exploit it, then also that's a high. The user interaction, it means if the user has to click on a link, if the user has to do something for the exploit to work, right click, left click, whatever that is, that's what it means. And then the scope is whether or not it's changed the scope of what you have. So if you're going after a server side vuln and you get a server side vuln that scope changes versus unchanged and also remember that cvss is very subjective and it's very it depends on your opinion but it's a very good place to make a case for the company to understand why you think it's a high or a critical vuln confidentiality integrity and availability these are things that i highly recommend getting uh familiar with but because we don't have a whole lot of time i'm going to quickly go through it confidentiality means how confidential is this information if it's showing you know someone's name email address Maybe we can go with a low depending on the company, um, but if it's showing their their home address, their phone number, their name, and every other information about them, that could go to a high. Integrity is whether or not you can actually, uh, so you can actually look at the descriptions of these, but it shows if you can uh, change it to some way. There's a, you know, there's a, can you make the integrity of this information being shown to other users, can you change that? Can you modify it? So... You know, depending on the vulnerability type, if you have a, again, if you have an idol where you can't edit stuff, it's none. If you can edit it, it could be, uh, depending on what it is, it could be low. If it's server side, then it could be high. So I highly, highly recommend uh, you learn CVSS uh, and use it to your own way. And availability is, you know, kind of like uh, denial of service. Can you make sure that the user doesn't access this data anymore? Um, can you, if, for example, if you're deleting it, it could be low, but if you are um, deleting the, you know, deleting a page versus deleting an account. Those are two different things. And again, these could change depending on the program. But it's a very good place, again, to go back and say, you know, tell the company, hey, I don't think this should be a, you know, medium, you know, the integrity and confidentiality should be high for these reasons. Uh, so please reconsider. And then the rest of it is pretty easy. We talked about them already. Put a title, put in the vulnerability type, give it an impact, attach all your screenshots, make sure everything looks good, and then push submit. 
Um, I know there were questions about uh, the bug bounty stuff that I talked about earlier. Uh, somebody asked what are my favorite bug bounty programs that I hack on. Uh, I, I've been hacking on Snapchat a little bit. Um, I did Uber, Ryzen Media, uh, Department of Defense. You can actually see all the programs that I've hacked on by going to my profile. Um, Airbnb was a huge one. I haven't hacked on them in a while. Um, so you can actually see what hackers like to hack on by going to their uh, thanks page. Let me see if I can figure that out really quickly. So I've hacked on 30, diff 37 different programs. Um, and these are my stats. Let me see if I can cheat and show you how. Uh, that page is gone, unfortunately. Um, but you can kind of scroll down and see all the volumes that I've submitted. You can see I've done a ton with Airbnb. I've done a ton with Rockstar Games uh, and so on. Oh, there it is. That's what I was looking for. So you can see I was, I'm second now, which I used to be number one. Uh, same thing with Valve. Uh, Rockstar Games, um, Localize, uh, and so on. You can see all of them by just scrolling through and kind of looking at it. <laughs> Thanks, X. Uh, so let's bring on, let's see, let's bring on Chris Holtz. And we're going to qu uh, quickly talk about um, the event that... Um, the Paranoids are doing so if you're not familiar let's go really quickly on twitter um the Paranoids are hosting a huge huge event um let's see right here they're doing a life hacking event um it's open to public they're doing something really really cool uh, anybody has a chance to join in on this um so if you're interested make sure you check it out and i think uh chris is going to tell us more about it so give me a sec i'm going to bring him on to the stream and we're going to see what it's about Hello again. Yeah. Let me put you on the screen. Chat, let me know if you can hear Chris. There we go. So I just kind of teased uh, a little bit of the event that's happening. I kind of pulled up the tweet and said that it's open to everybody, but I kind of want to hear what that means. How does it work, man? Uh, tell us. So, uh, so yeah. So previously, most, most of the events uh, that we've done have been a specific set of invitations. Um, uh, and, and the instructions for like how we set the the invitations have, have changed over time. It's been a little more rigorous recently than than earlier. But generally, you know, we, we look at who are the top hackers that either perform at live events in that sort of really high pressure situation, um, or who is familiar with our program and our, our products that if we point them in a particular direction, they'll be um, you know super effective in that direction for a compressed period of time. Um, so the events have been limited. With with this event particularly, um, you know, we we started planning this what years back was the 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 core idea started forming. Um, <clears throat> we started planning something big for September last year, and everything kind of fell apart earlier this year when um, when the world seemed to fall apart. Um, but we as as we worked on our last event, H one two thousand four. Uh, H1 2004, 2020, April 2024. Um, we, we took we took an event that we were planning for. Uh, it was planned to be in, take place in Singapore, and we turned it into a virtual event. Um, and we we did a whole bunch of stuff uh, with with you on the stream here um, around that time, and it was it was a lot of fun. But one of the core pieces of feedback we got was, hey, if this is virtual, there's no travel involved. Why not open it up? Why can't why can't I be invited? Right. Um, so we took that feedback and um, worked it into our plan for this next event, specifically opening up um, the first piece of it to the whole world. So if you can sign up for a HackerOne account, you can participate in this event. Um, and uh, so, so the, the event itself is a three-piece, three, three event series. We're starting with H1 2010-open. Uh, um, the open round is going to start on September 10th. Uh, it'll be five days of hacking on scope that is yet to be announced. <clears throat> we'll have a scoping call early in the morning on the 10th, and then submissions will open, so you'll be able to start hacking. Um, if you rank in the top 50 coming out of that event, you'll get an invitation over to the next piece of it, which is going to run on uh, October 1st. Um, and if you rank in the top 25 from that one, then you'll get to the final round. And the final is going to have uh, that's going to start on the October 13th. I think it's the 14th. 
Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we're really looking forward to, to having this, this totally open um, opportunity just to see, see who's out there, right? Uh, the, the landscape has changed so much since the structure of live events kind of solidified over the past year or so. And, uh, and this, was, this was really an opportunity to open that back up and not feel like, you know, we're inviting our top people and our top, we know our top people and we love our top people, but who's, who's right below that, right? Maybe, maybe those folks, there's been a lot of shuffle in, in that part of the stack and we want to bubble that up, give opportunity to, to anyone who wants to put the time in. Um, so there's, there's no specific invitation for this. It's just submit your username and you'll get, you'll get invited. Yeah, and I think it's great because now it makes it a even playing field, right? Everybody has an equal chance to participate. It's just if you put in the efforts and the chances to get in, then you get in and you get to go to the next phase. And and you're not doing this for free. You're getting bounties as you go. You know, it's not just a qualifier is where you're qualifying and putting in your time. You're getting paid, and then you gotta go to the next level. There's more money, more bounties involved, and obviously the last one is probably going to be even more insane and uh, more fun to make bounties from. So again. Um, if you are, I've, I've known people that have been asking for invites and how do I get invited? This is your chance. You just have to participate and put in the work and see where it goes. Um, what about cool prizes? I know you guys have done some really cool prizes in the past. What do they get for each? Is there a prize for each stage or is it just a finale thing that they get a huge prize? Uh, so we'll, we'll do an announcement. Um, I think next week that, that does a wrap up of all the awards and things. Um, the, the stuff we've announced so far is that we'll have, um, some individual awards, like monetary awards, for um, like really well written reports. We'll do that at, at each each event. Um, we'll do some Twitter callouts on you know like our, our hacker of the day feature. Who was our best hacker yesterday, mm -hmm. today, kind of thing. Um, so we'll get some callouts on there, and and uh, we've got we'll be making some rings. Um, rings have been a popular thing. Hacker One has the the MVH belt, yep. and uh, a couple years ago we didn't. You know, we wanted to have like our own kind of award. So we started making rings. We were trying to do like a, a championship event at that time. And the structure, it, that, that event, H1212 in 2018, that event structure was uh, very similar to this in some regards, but also wildly different. Yeah. Um, but uh, we started rings then. We did rings last year for our, our uh, end of the year um, hacking event. So we're bringing that back this year. We're going to have a brand new ring design um, that features the keyhole and um, and the the title of uh, Bug Bounty World Champion. So we'll have a ring for first, second, and third place. Um, you know, there's there's the regular live event awards of like uh, best bug and uh, most reputation, greatest signal. I think um, the the typical Hacker One awards are going to be in there. Um, and uh, we were, we were just talking about something earlier today. I don't. I assume that I can tease this, and if not, I'm sorry, Sean. <laughs> but um, <laughs> what we we Mark had the brilliant idea of um, top ten who get to the end. You know, even if there's not a ring for you, you know, you've you've proven yourself, right? You've gone through the gauntlet of three events and ranked in the top ten out of the whole world. So we're gonna open up for sure. We, the paranoids have been hiring for years. We are, right. There's a shortage of jobs in the industry. Um, it's hard to find great people. So we're taking this as an opportunity to recruit and top 10 are going to get interviews. We'll, we'll find a team that you're interested in, in the paranoids and set you up with an interview. If you want it, if you don't want it. That's awesome. Pass, so, but, wow. That's um, very awesome. Well, yeah. thank you so much, man. I'm excited to see where this goes. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be some, more streams around it and more content comes out of it. I did post a link into the chat. I'm going to do it one more time. So if you're interested in learning how to get involved, uh, I see Colby also dropped a link to it for you guys' blog. Also through the Hacker One um, event link also as well. Uh, thank you so much, man. Um, I can't wait to see where this event goes. And kudos to you, you guys and Hacker One for innovating uh, life hacking events. Thanks. Thanks, man. See ya. See ya. All right, last but not least, this is the the portion of this uh, quote-unquote virtual seminar that I'm excited about. I have two uh, very special guests. Both are um, 
researchers and hackers that are on the Paranoids team who will be involved uh, be coming up and sharing their success story with us about how they got started and how they got into the field. Before I do this, I need you guys all to hype this chat up. I need to see some emotes and some fun, see some flying toasters, some hacker man emotes. Uh, make it happen while I bring on our last guest. And before we wrap it up with, uh, we have also one more person coming on, uh, Sean Porras, who will also be wrapping this up at the end. Uh, but before we bring on our success stories, let's hype this up. And I'm going to work in the background to make that happen. And uh, just a big thank you to everybody that so far has been a part of this. Whether you're a new follower, you're a new subscriber, cheering, whatever you're doing. I seriously appreciate you all. Thank you so much for everybody that's supporting the stream. Um, I can't thank you all enough. <laughs> all right. Hello. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Going good. We are live, so I'm just going to give that heads up to you both. Um, before we get started, I would love to kind of hear who you guys are and what your role is at Verizon Media. Uh, Jess, starting with you, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, so my name's Jess. I go by SIG online. Um, I am a SOC analyst intern um, in the Paranoids, and I am also a uh, computer science student at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. Very cool. What about you, Brandon? Hey, how's everyone doing? Uh, my name is Brandon Coates, and I am a security engineer focusing mostly on uh, containers and cloud stuff at Verizon Media right now. So I'm curious to hear. Um, how did you both get into the field that you're in? Uh, Jess, if you don't mind starting with you, how did you uh, get involved? How did you get your internship? What made you want to do this, go down this route anyways? So I used to work with horses, believe it or not, professionally. Um, I was on Olympic teams. And while I was touring, I made a friend. And uh, that friend was in InfoSec. And he started sharing more and more about InfoSec. And I the more I learned about it, the more interested I became, uh, the more I started digging into it myself. Um, I decided that I wanted to see if I, if I really loved it or not, or if, what, what, what about it did I really love? So I sent myself to DEF CON after some research. Um, and I found that I, the community is fantastic and amazing. I got involved with um, crypto, communities um and that's how i got to know the bug bounty program um i saw on twitter that there was an option for an internship and uh at paranoids i had heard about paranoids before from defcon derbycon um and it it seemed like the place that i wanted to be and so far it absolutely has been um yeah so very cool. I applied. Thankfully, I got in. That's awesome. That's a that's a very cool story. I didn't I didn't know the depth of this. I didn't realize you know that you had a complete change of uh, work. It's it's incredible mm -hmm. to see you have taken you know going to DefCon had that impact for you to want to get involved in a uh, deeper way with the community and then getting an internship to get your foot into the door. Yeah, absolutely. I'm really, really, really glad that I did. <laughs> what about you, Brandon? Uh, where did you get started? How did you get into this? InfoSec and what's your background like? Sure. Um, so I went to uh, Howard University. Uh, I always got to shout out my school there, especially HBCs are kind of on the rise right now. So I want to shout out to all my folks out there. Um, so I went there for computer science and that kind of actually started back in high school. Um, we happened to have a computer math class where we learned basic C++ programming. And I was like, this is pretty cool. Yeah. Decided to make that my major and I went to Howard um, where I picked up jobs with other programming languages. However, at that time, uh, like web wasn't a thing and system programming was pretty boring. So I didn't want to do that. Um, so actually when I left school, I actually was a sysadmin and uh, I'm in the DC area and a lot of these are, a lot of the jobs right here are government related government contracting. Mm -hmm. So I started doing the government contracting world. So I started as a sysadmin and then started as a cloud admin. And really at the time that really just meant that people were running VMs that other people were using. So did some admin work there, then eventually got to testing. Uh, which is pretty cool. I started doing some testing security products, and that's where I kind of backbone security because um, I always had to work with our security team, you know, to say, hey, our system secure, how do we do it? Then I say, well, maybe I want to run the security stuff. So I started doing that. Um, and from the testing, I actually picked up a job as being a pen tester, which was uh, pretty interesting. Um, that's also what I kept hearing you say to the folks to say, you know, uh, be honest with yourself. 
I had to be honest with myself as a pen tester. I just did not have the patience for it. Uh, yeah. To be a pen tester, you have to be wrong a lot. Are you going to be wrong a lot when you're testing things out? I just got frustrated me a lot. So I had a pen testing job. I started going like B sides, uh, similar to Jess, I started going like B sides, uh, DC. And actually ran into somebody who introduced me to a group called Nova Hackers here in the Northern Virginia area. And they actually had a talk or the it was host, they had a talk hosted at the AOL campus. And even from then, I just kind of walked up to the system and said, hey, look, I'm trying to get out of the government world and we'll get more private stuff. And he said, here, uh, apply for this job. And that's how I did it. And since then, I've been with AOL for a couple of years now, or excuse me, AOL at the time to Oath to Verizon Media now. Uh, so I started out kind of like a jack of all trades in our vulnerability management program. Uh, we're actually in the very beginning, I worked a little bit on the uh, AOL's bug bunny program at the time it was called Secbone. We're basically, we're just giving out people, and we call them internet points. So we gave them a little name on the dashboard and say, hey, here's your name. You did a good job. All up to now where we're doing the full fledged bug bunny program. Uh, so I was involved with that, but uh, I was doing mostly vulnerability management, uh, and which basically meant a whole bunch of scripting to automate a lot of security tools and kind of continue that today, except focusing on cloud containers. Yeah, um, I'm curious to understand, like, you know, there's a lot of people that want, you know, you, you, you both have different backgrounds. You, you know, Brandon, you went to school for computer science. Jess, you said you were working with horses. You got interested in computers and then you break into InfoSec. What is your advice? I'll start with you, Jess. What is your advice for people that want to do a, what you did? They want, they're doing something that, you know, they don't want to do any longer. They want to break into tech, more specifically InfoSec. What is your advice? How, you know, how can someone do the same thing as you have done? I think the most important thing is to like it. <laughs> um, I think the most important thing is to uh, really be interested and find your niche area. Um, one of the things why, why I sent myself to uh, DEF CON was to see, you know, what part of security did I really like? Do I want to do bug bounty? Do I want to do, you know, vulnerability management? Do I want to do blue team stuff? Do I want to do red team stuff? Yeah. What exactly is it? Do I want to do social engineering. Um, what exactly is it about it that you like? Um, and try things out. Really, you're not going to know if you like it until you've really tried it out and gotten to know the thing. Um, I really feel like if I had not gotten my foot in the door, if I had not started out doing CTFs, even though sometimes they can be really intimidating um, when you're just getting into it, when you're just starting out with the CTFs or just stepping into doing a bug bounty, um, it can be intimidating and it can be, um, you can feel kind of discouraged, but there's so many people out there that are willing to be mentors and willing to help you out. There's an amazing community that I'm a part of on Discord called Dead Pixel Sec. Um, I found them and they're, every question that I have, I'm able to go and ask them and be like, I know this might be a stupid question. They're like, no, it's not a stupid question. Just ask. Um, it's, it's important to, to be curious. I feel like, yeah, that's the main thing. So curiosity, passion, and then the CTF and having the attitude want to go get it pretty much. Yeah. What about absolutely. you? What about you, Brandon? Uh, for someone who's done uh, the computer science work, it's like the reason why I ask this, you know, separately is there's a ton of CS uh, CS students that are kind of like, I want to get into SEC. What do I do? How do I get started? I have no clue what to do. My school didn't teach me this stuff, or they did, but it's at a you know, it's a super high level. What's your advice? Um, yes, that's probably true. Most computer science teaches you like how computers work on the inside and like algorithmic and all that stuff. And honestly, those skills are actually good to have as well. They're good. Another piece of advice I give a lot of people is find out how things work, uh, because security is really about uh, securing things. And in order to secure, you have to know how it works, period. So if you learn how things work. Um, and then one thing I've been telling a lot of people lately in the past couple of years, because they're exposed, is to get involved with the bug bag program, mostly because that way, at least you're getting paid while you're learning um, is a big thing. I always want to tell people, you know, might as well get paid while you're learning. Um, but kind of to Jess's point, the other thing I would say is really uh, networking. Like I said, I kind of just walked up to the CISO of AOL. So DEF CON is a, it's a huge jump. Uh, I can see, I can understand here. Uh, I went like once and I was kind of taken aback by how many people are there. Um, that's why I really recommend the B-sides. So B-sides are basically, uh, think of them as smaller, more regional DEF CONs. So uh, and for instance, in Northern Virginia, we have B-sides Nova, B-sides DC. Um, those are smaller things you can go in there and talk to people and they typically have CTF. So you can network with people, learn new skills, um, and just kind of, you know, up your skills by networking with other people while you're there. So 
I will say networking is probably a big thing. And then also just uh, the curiosity to go and try things out. Like Bug Bounty gives you a very good opportunity to do that. And then also just being willing to learn a lot. Um, if you can get a subscription to something like a Safari book, so let's say your current job might have a subscription to Safari and you want to learn something new, like Kubernetes, what is that? You know, pick up a book and read about it. Um, but usually there's also a lot of blogs out for things too. So if you can't, you know, pay for the subscription services or your for job doesn't buy one, go ahead and put it in Google and see what you find and learn from there. Yeah, and just to wrap yours up, I think you both kind of nailed it on the head of the curiosity thing. But I can relate to both both of these. I've, you know, I was a CS major who didn't want to do CS, but then decided to say, screw it, I'm going to go do bug bounties. So yours is like knowing the computer's basics. You know, networking is huge, and I'll talk about that in a little bit too, and then curiosity. I want to echo out what both of you said about conferences. I also scored my first job in InfoSec through going to DEF CON. Um, it was my second time. I went to DEF CON for the first time alone. Nobody went with me. I went alone and I didn't even, I just went to talks and went to the hotel and, you know, did my, my, uh, my wife went with me and then we came back and that was it. Um, but now uh, the second year when I went, I did a little bit of bug bounties. I knew like three, four people that I met up with and I ended up with, uh, a CEO or someone up there at a, in a suite. I was drinking next to them and they're like, Hey, why don't you come work with us? I'm like, why don't you hire me then? Um, <laughs> so I want to echo that out. Like it's incredible to, you know, DEF CON could be a little bit more expensive, but there are tons of good, um, you know, people have fundraisers that they do. There are, um, you know, there's all these different ways you can go to it if you can't afford it, but also going to these local, um, you know, local B sides or other, um, conferences would also be very beneficial because local companies who are recruiting or looking for college talent are also going to be at these conferences and also get to network and meet new people. Um, so I definitely agree. Uh, networking is a very, very big part, no matter what you want to do outside of InfoSec even, if you can network yourself, it's you're, you're ahead of the game by a few steps. I just say also there's really ways to get involved locally. So there's usually a DEF CON group in your area if you look um, and Google them. Or if you're a university student, um, see if you have a cybersecurity club or an infosec club or start your own. Um, that's what I did. <laughs> um, I kind of started my own and, and, and turned it into a thing. Uh, you can bring in your own content and be a little bit selfish and be like, you know what, I really want to learn this thing. So I'm going to call this person and have them come in and speak to the group. Um, and then you're sharing the knowledge with everybody. It's not just about you. Um, yeah. yeah. And one thing I kind of want to bring up too, because it sounds like we all three just said it, but I want to say a computer science degree is not a prerequisite to get into the post -sec. Um, Absolutely. I'll, I'll say most of my career, the teams I've been on, there's been more people who come to a non-traditional path or non-CS path in security than there are people with like computer science degrees or even now cybersecurity degrees. So it's it's a nice to have this. I wouldn't call it a prerequisite. So don't let that prevent you from trying to uh, get into the industry. Yeah, honestly, like I'm, I talk about this a lot on my on my streams. I have my computer degree right here. It's sitting right there. People ask about it. And I tell them it's just a piece of paper that didn't do anything for me. It learned, you know, I learned the basics of computers. Don't get me wrong. I learned, you know, I learned Java, unfortunately, and C that I don't use <laughs> at all. But I learned the basics of computer and it kind of helped me understand things in more in depth. But it's freaking 2020. There's so many free resources out there. You know, 10 years ago, there wasn't a Code Academy, There wasn't yeah. a Pentester Lab or Hacker 101 or any of these, you know, free platforms. It was just you read a book, you learn it in theory and you get a job and you figure it out. Um, I want to kind of wrap this up with something that you said just about mentors and Ben and the same thing with you. Were there anybody that you would say you looked up to or mentored you? How, you know, how much did mentorship uh, affect you with where you are today? And what do you recommend for people that are looking to find someone that could show them the light or be a mentor? Um, I would not be where I am right now if it wasn't for my mentors. Um, okay. Sean Thomas, who is my current manager, took a chance on me. Um, I came in with my, uh, with my resume and I was like, I'm really into InfoSec. Here are the things that I'm interested in. Uh, I really, really have a passion for this, but I don't have any experience. Um, and thankfully he, he took a chance on me and let me, um, come in and learn from the SOC. Um, that's how I became an intern. Um, I have another, uh, mentor who means a lot to me who blind hacker. Um, he's been hyping you up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, it's honestly like without my mentors, like I, I would not be where I am. It's important to go out and try and find someone who's willing to take a chance on you. 
Right. What about and, you, Brandon? Yeah, I've had, I haven't had a, what I would call like a, an official mentor, like a, someone who's a bit more industry experience with me. For me, it's usually more so I put myself there and just talk to people. So kind of back to that networking. And then I find kind of actually when I get on the job, my mentors usually tend to actually be my coworkers. So sometimes, you know, you talk with people and you kind of gain the experience for them. So I've never really had the, the uh, like, you know, this is who I go to about everything or learning about certain things. I haven't really had that. I kind of wish I did. Yeah. I think because uh, a lot of times I make guesses and I, my mentor has re- usually been experienced. And, you know, they say experience is that thing you get right and you need it. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll say if, if you don't have like that official mentor, make sure you lean on kind of like your peers, your, your people side by side. They can help and teach you a lot of things um, and just learn from other people's experience like that. Yeah, and I don't think it needs to be direct internship. You know, like Jess, you were really lucky to find you know a few folks uh, that were um, that you reached out to and you put in the effort to you know have that mentorship. But also, it could be indirect mentorship, right? Like Ben and what you're saying, your peers, your friends, just watching tutorials online and seeing how others have done it indirectly, learning from them. It doesn't have to be that one to one. I'm I'm in the middle. I've had people that were mentors that didn't really you know I lost touch with after a while. They changed careers or whatever, but then. There's been other people that I've looked at their content, their videos, their articles, their blog posts, and that sort of thing. Um, unfortunately, go ahead, Jess. I said absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just uh, I want to wrap this up on a um, on a good note. So, if both of you could give a piece of advice to anybody that wants to get into infosec, um, what would it be? Let's start with you, Brandon, this time. Uh, the world is your oyster these days. Like you just got so many resources available to you now. And, um, so you have things like this Twitch stream, you have YouTube content, you have blog posts and just let you know, if people have been in the industry, I've been doing FOSEC for over, I don't know, let's say technology for over 10 years, FOSEC for more than half of that. Even I'm still learning. So just remember that you're always going to be learning. It doesn't mean you're dumb or anything like that. It's just the way the world technology works. It's big, keeps moving. So, you know, just have that thirst to want to learn more and use all the resources that you have available, be it online or the people you work with, or just know from uh, networking. So have the hunger is the main thing. Uh, what about you, Jess? I want to build on that and, and say, ask questions. Um, ask questions and be curious and um, never feel like one of those questions is too dumb to ask. Um, I, I feel like getting involved is super, super, super important. Make a Twitter, make a, um, get on Discord, um, watch people on Twitch, on YouTube, um, and reach out to them and, and try to get involved in the community as much as you can. Um, I think that that will make the biggest difference once you feel the sense of community that is involved in InfoSec. Yeah. Well, hey, I want to say thank you both so much for coming here and sharing your stories with me and everybody watching. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I can't wait to see what you guys do next. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye. See you. Bye. All right. The Blind Hacker, thank you so much for all of those subs. I really appreciate you. Um, there's one more piece. We're going to bring on Sean Porras with Ryzen Media. Uh, he's going to help us wrap this up really quickly. Um, before I do bring him up, if you are a new uh, viewer, just remember that uh, there's a Discord. You link your Discord. If you are a new subscriber, I mean, link your Discord to your account, and you get to use the entire uh, the benefits that come with the subscribers for the subscriptions. All right, let's bring Sean Porus. This will be the last bit of the seminar. We're gonna wrap this up and uh, be back on later. Let's bring on Sean. Hey, Sean. What's happening, doing? Ben? How's it going? Outstanding. How are you? Not bad. Not bad. We're on the last five, ten minutes of our seminar. So I know we kept the best for last. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, it was, you know, and it, it was a it was a great session. I mean, um, the purpose of this was to really talk about, um, you know, inclusion in the in the industry and to make bug bounty accessible. And I think we did a great job at that. You know, we opened with our CISO talking about our mission and the paranoids and our, our commitment to inclusion. We segue over to Chris Holt talking a little bit about the Verizon Media Bug Bounty program and some about events. And then Ben, your session was super informative and really helped people, I think, figure out how they can maybe get a foothold into the world of hacking and bug bounty. Uh, and then our success stories were awesome. I mean, Jess and Brandon are fantastic. And I don't know if people saw in the um, in the in the chat section, but 
uh, you know, Brandon posted that original, it was the AOL Hall of Fame page. And that's where we would list people. And that was that early precursor. Um, anyway, so, you know, I think the, the theme that I got from this is, first of all, um, you know, there's a lot of resources out there. There's an amazing community that's evolved, in particular in the last, you know, five to seven years, really feels like it's gotten more inclusive, more uh, materials, more mentoring, more guidance, more videos to learn how to enter cybersecurity and to enter the bug bounty and ethical hacking world. Um, for, for me, the takeaway here is the greatest of journeys begins with a single step. So the first thing is to go try some of these techniques. Right. The second thing is we have this amazing live hacking event that we're opening up to the globe. Um, this may not happen again. It may become part of what we do. We just don't know. So this is your opportunity. So if you want to be on the ground level and part of something special, I highly recommend that you register for the event, go to the, the Paranoids or Hacker One Twitter account and go ahead and register. Start practicing and just take it out for a spin and try it out, be part of a scoping call and uh, get a sense for what a live event is all about. Everyone is invited and we're so, so, so excited about that. And, and in fact, um, Stoke has a, uh, a channel, a YouTube channel as well. And Chris Holt's gonna be talking more details about the event itself. So that'll be available, I think on Thursday, perhaps tomorrow, I'm not sure. I think it's part of Bounty Thursdays, but uh, we'll talk more about the event then. And um, I just want to thank you for, for hosting this on your awesome uh, Twitch channel, everybody for participating. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun for us. And the Paranoids are, are just super excited about the event and the rest of the year and uh, keep charging out front with Bug Bounty. Yeah, well, thanks for having me as well. You guys have been a big part of this channel since day one by, you know, letting me doing their Recon Sunday thing with, uh, you know, the Yahoo assets and, you know, you guys' involvement with the community has, you know, helped us push the Bug Mountain community forward. Uh, so, you know, thank you to you guys as well. It's not just... Um, it's not just Holtz and myself and Stoke. It's also people like you that are in the background making these happen for us. Uh, so thank you for, you know, making all this happen as well. I uh, appreciate that. And I would be remiss without thanking my amazing team. We got Chris Holt, Mark Litchfield, Max Staples, and Bonnie Viteri, who is uh, the glue that keeps a lot of these events going. So thank you all so much, as well as my awesome ProdSec team. I love you guys. Thank you, man. I appreciate it so much. And uh, I can't wait to see where this event goes. Me too. Me too. It's going to be a wild ride. <laughs> thank you so much, man. We'll talk soon. All right. Cheers. Thanks, Ben. See ya. Bye. All right, this was a quick and short uh, seminar into getting started with hacking and bug bounties uh, with the Paranoids. I appreciate them letting me, as always, be a part of these events and helping with the community work that comes with it. Uh, but that's it for me for today. Again, I will be back online uh, throughout my regular schedule of Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Mondays uh, starting next week. This weekend, I'm taking it off for last weekend so I can kind of finalize all the stuff. But if you're a new viewer, you haven't followed, hit me with that follow button so you can get an update. Make sure you enroll in Discord. Um, I'm doing a lot of giveaways this week in Discord. So if you want to participate in Discord giveaways, make sure you go and sign in and join our Nahomi's channel. Other than that, I appreciate you all. Thank you, everybody, for all the gifts, all the subs, all the cheers, all the new follows. Thank you. Thank you so much. I cannot thank you guys enough for being so supportive and always being a part of these streams and showing up and hanging out with me and the guests that I bring on. Uh, thank you all so much. I appreciate it. And I'll be back online to my regular schedule starting next week. Until then, thank you so much and we'll talk soon.